everyone, and welcome to Learnings from Sustainability Steering, Sustainability, I can't say it, so I'm just gonna say Sustainably Steering the Kubernetes Project. Uh, my name is Bob Killen. I am known as Mr. Bobby Tables across all the things. I am a program manager for Google's Open Source Programs Office, and I'm a member of the Kubernetes Steering Committee. Hey everyone, uh, I am Navarun. I work as a staff engineer at VMware, and I am also one of the members of the steering committee, and also chair of the Kubernetes SIG contributor experience. To start with, I want to welcome our new members who recently joined us, Machie, Paco, and Patrick, who have a term until the end of uh, 2025, September 2025, and they will be joining us. Um, Stephen got re-elected for another turn, and they will be joining us again, like Ben, myself, and Bob. And we have a few people here in the audience as well. Ben. Yeah, Machie. And with that, we want to thank our uh, previous steering committee members, Christophe, who is in the audience, uh, Tim, and Carlos. And with that, uh, this is the first time in the history of the steering committee that we have more members from outside North America than inside North America. Yep. It's the uh, first time we've had representation from China as well. Yes. And with that comes a, comes a unique set of challenges. Since we are spread over so many time zones, we can't have a very good meeting time to talk about. And then we have to do a lot of our stuff async, but this is a very good problem to have, and we are very delighted to solve this problem. Try and move more async. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, yeah. Might, you might already know the Kubernetes org is like really big. We have 83,000 plus contributors, 1,800 plus org members, which contribute to 354 repositories, combining all of the Kubernetes uh, orgs. And we have like 34 community groups. We'll talk more about <coughs> what we have been doing about the community groups, their life cycle, uh, shutting some, some groups down because they have ended their uh, lifespan or spinning up new groups in a later <coughs> section. With that. Okay. So to begin this, like what does steering do? Well, the formal definition, and if you don't mind, I am actually just going to read it. Uh, <laughs> the Kubernetes Steering Committee is the governing body of the Kubernetes project, providing decision-making and oversight pertaining to the Kubernetes project bylaws, sub-organizations, and financial planning. The Steering Committee also defines the project values and structure. It's honestly a pretty good TLDR. Um, that was weird. Uh, what we actually really do is like review charters from our subprojects. We look at their scopes, their responsibilities. Um, overall, we sort of define and evolve the non-technical vision for the project. Uh, we need to sort of evolve with the state of the project. Um, you know, Kubernetes is just about 10 years old, and what it does today is very different from, you know, 10 years ago. Um, we need to determine the types of groups, roles, and structure that are most appropriate for us at this point in time and will help us have a sustainable future. Uh, we also are the primary group that interacts with the CNCF. Uh, so if there is a financial request or if there is some need for um, to interact with them for one reason or another, that is, we are the, the, the body that does it. But really, what does steering really do? Well, really, we plan for the long-term sustainability of Kubernetes. Uh, a lot of the things that we actually do might not have an impact until we are done with our term. But our goal is to just make sure that the project itself uh, can out honestly outlast us and outlast our terms. Um, and the way that steering does this is through governance and policy. The, the changes that we make, um, again, are slow, might not be effective for a while, but like we also, like we spend a lot of time on these things. Um, and, you know, 
steering tends to move pretty slow, but that is intentional. We are trying to put a lot of thought into what we do and their impact. Now, we actually have a few recent changes that we'll go over, um, and these kind of went into effect over the past year. Uh, some changes to sub-project leads and our chair and TL split, as well as revisiting some of our groups. So, to you first, before we dive into it, uh, this is what is known as our contributor ladder. Um, we have this as sort of a path of growth for people to enter the project and go from you know contributor to org member, and then we have a reviewer, approver, and subproject owner. A reviewer is someone that is added to an owner's file and is sort of the first like rung on the ladder where they are tagged in first to do first line review of PRs and things of that nature. Um, as they become you know, more familiar with the code base and more trusted, they will then go to approver, where they are then allowed to merge code in their specific area. And then they move up to subproject owner, where they are sort of a root approver for that area. And this is what we, we had before. So I'm going to talk about something, a change that we did really recently. So what time we realized that we need one more level as a stepping stone into becoming uh, or coming into the contributor ladder or the leadership ladder. So Bob mentioned the ladder in which people grow from <coughs> becoming a non-Kubernetes org member to a sub-project owner. But what do we really mean in that process, right? So we sat and we thought about like how do we uh, make that role really formal. So we did have sub-project owner for a long time, but we, what we wanted to do was make it a formal part of our contributor ladder. So we introduced a role called sub-project lead. The key difference being the sub-project lead has more responsibilities compared to just being a sub-project owner. So sub-project owners are essentially owners of code, but then sub-project leads are also expected to have some technical direction for the area that they are lead of. And you can think of like, it to be a more bubble down version of a technical lead. A technical lead is, a SIG technical lead is supposed to handle like multiple areas or all areas of the SIG that they are a technical lead of. And a subproject lead is only w needed to supervise areas in the area that they are in their subproject essentially. So there are a lot of differences uh, between like a technical lead and a subproject lead, but these are like, it is designed to be a funnel to eventually become a technical lead in, inside a SIG. And this also gives the opportunity for the SIG chairs and technical leads to essentially grow contributors to a, through a well-defined funnel. So if someone is a SIG technical lead, they can essentially identify people who can be future technical leads through the subproject leads of the subprojects inside that SIG. And this gives a really good structured way for people to grow. Yeah, for the most part, it's honestly just recognizing a lot of the people that are already doing the work. We have uh, people that have been standouts in these roles for a while. Now we are just giving them a title. Um, the other thing that sort of complements this is uh, the chair and TL split. So before, um, we've had like two top level roles of a like a chair, which is usually the one that does like, I, I don't want to say like all the administrative work, but they're the ones that organize the, the SIG, the group, and make sure everything is functioning as they should, making sure all the, like they're handling all the transparency requirements, the SIG is in good health, looking out for um, you know, the various areas that might need to grow future people. And the, the tech lead role was specifically focused on so the, the, te the, the stewardship of the code or the area that you know, it owns. Um, and before, the tech lead role would roll up to the chair if no uh, tech lead was explicitly defined. And this actually caused a uh, lot of confusion because you had some people that were chairs that were also TLs and other places where they were chairs with separate TLs and there was a lot of um, both you know, confusion from people that needed to seek certain approvals as well as like when it comes to 
growing someone into a future role with them being conflated, it was really hard to sort of, you know, find people that could satisfy all of the above, where it's a lot easier to find people that could do, you know, um, a just one of the two roles. Um, I should have pressed this slide or pressed this earlier. That was my mistake. <laughs> this essentially just summarizes what I was saying. The other big thing to go sort of along with this out of revisiting our roles and how things um, you know sort of split, the we've also been like revisiting our groups and our requirements for our groups. Um, you know, governance should change with the project and to like best achieve the project's goals at that point in time. Um, and the current state of both Kubernetes and sort of the cloud native uh, landscape as a whole is quite a bit different from when, you know, our gov governance is first uh, drafted. Um, and a large portion of our governance is like how we divide and essentially self-manage ourselves. And we do that through management of groups. And so we've been looking at a lot of our groups and looking at, you know, does this group continue to serve the goals of the project? Is it active? Um, is it, um, does it have enough people interested in it to sustain it in the future? Um, are there any, you know, reasonable changes that can be made to it to help it succeed? Or should we spin it down? And, you know, with the current state of things, we just kind of need to, like, marry conduit, and if it doesn't spark joy, you know, yeet it out of the org. This led us to recently uh, retire our user groups. Um, years ago, there were, you know, SIGs for, like, the big cloud providers, you know, Google, Amazon, VMware, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it was determined that it really didn't make sense for them to continue as uh, independent SIGs, and there wasn't really like a long, well, enough like long-term work to justify them as those independent groups. Um, and it just like didn't really align to have like, again, the provider-specific groups in there. Um, so those wound up being uh, moved under like uh, one umbrella SIG cloud provider, uh, but there's still like a gap in there where, you know, users of those cloud providers could previously um, engage and provide feedback that would then be used by the groups. Um, and that sort of bore our idea of creating a user group back in the day. Uh, unfortunately, those groups were never really taken up on. Like, there is one group, um, like a VMware user group. There's also a big data user group. But they, they never really took off and didn't really, you know, help the project overall. Um, they did have their own little communities and things, but they weren't you know, helpful to the project as a whole. And there's other things where like these days there were better alignment with them interacting at the CNCF level than the Kubernetes project level. Um, so for us, it just made sense for us to you know, spin them down. And we did this largely like, it, it just removed extra overhead and streamlined our own governance to honestly just help us manage things at this current point in time. So it also wasn't just user groups that we retired. Um, in the past year, we've retired uh, several SIGs and working groups. SIG usability was uh, created with the intent to improve the overall user experience and accessibility of Kubernetes. Um, but like it, that, it honestly wound up being fairly difficult to attract people to do that kind of work. It just, frankly, it wasn't incentivized by a lot of people. It was really carried by a few people that you know were really passionate about it, um, but it was hard to get them support. And in the end, it just made the most sense to, to spin it down. Um, another was SIG Service Catalog. Again, there was a few very passionate people in it. Um, but like the their like latest release hadn't been updated in several years, and you know again it just kind of made sense for us to spin it down. Uh, others, the like the multi tenancy working group had a very similar story. Uh, one actual like highlight is the reliability working group. While that spun down, it did actually succeed at its mission. Um, we introduced 
uh, like its goal was to increase the reliability bar of Kubernetes so that we could have you know, more reliable release practices. And we wound up introducing a process called the uh, production readiness review as part of our release process. And it's now just baked into every, every release. Everything is looked at and evaluated to make sure that every feature is evaluated for its ability to, you know, is it uh, implementing the right amount of observability? Is, it a is there a feature flag so that makes it easy for it to, you know, roll back if needed? And that process, um, you know, once the reliability working group had succeeded at its mission, uh, and it's, it's, it was spun down. Um, then the, the last one, the IoT Edge working group, is a case where, uh, another sort of like successful one, you know, it, it didn't make a lot of sense for it to exist at the Kubernetes level, uh, but it made sense for it to exist at the CNCF level because it was interacting with a lot of the IoT Edge projects. So we've been working on transferring it from Kubernetes to the CNCF um, just to, you know, give everything the best fit and best chance to succeed overall. But that, we spin down groups, but doesn't mean that we don't accept new groups. Sorry. So in the past one year, or in the past six months, actually. Read the microphone a little bit. Uh, in the past six months, we had two new groups. We have SIG HCD now and Working Group LTS, working towards their mission. Um, they aren't really new per se, but have some backstory behind their recent additions back to the project. Coming to HCD, so we have to realize like what's the backstory behind it. So here you can see like one of one issue created by Dims in if I remember this is the TOC group, uh, the TOC GitHub repo talking about the health of the HCD project. Now it's really good that projects are projects raise flags when they feel like the traction is low or they need more maintainers or more contributors to even sustain their growth. And it's more so important for projects like HCD, which serve as the storage backbone of Kubernetes. Without HCD, Kubernetes will not exist at this point. We might need to like invest in or find a new storage engine for our APIs, you know, for our API objects. And it's very fair that uh, sometimes due to such issues, projects can go into a crisis mode and people are already burnt out because of that. So what happened after that was, HCD was actually proposed as a Kubernetes SIG to help HCD gain more traction and HCD get the resources that we have in the Kubernetes community and align more. It made more sense because the goals of HCD or why HCD exists is very closely tied to Kubernetes' resource model and how Kubernetes talks to its storage backend. And with that, it was put into vote, and we had unanimous approval to accept HCD into the Kubernetes project. And we did add HCD back into the project. Talking about LTS, so what is the backstory behind LTS? So way back in 2017 or 2018, if I remember correctly, LTS was something that was thought of, and uh, a working group started back then uh, with the goal of identifying how do you support Kubernetes for a longer duration. In 2020-ish, we spun down the group uh, by achieving certain things, uh, specifically uh, increasing the support of Kubernetes from nine months to one year, satis like aligning with the business uh, life cycles of uh, the vendors. But then, during KubeCon EU this year, Discussions about support, supporting Kubernetes for a long term again began uh, like picking up traction. And more so because vendors started doing it on their own in that time frame, and it made a lot of sense for everyone to align efforts and align with the community goals on how LTA should be done. An unconference at the Kubernetes uh, Contributor Summit during Amsterdam resulted in WGLTS to be reformed, and here we see an issue from Jeremy to essentially like describe the conclusions uh, which were achieved at the end of that unconference and proposing LTS to be back as a uh, working group. Um, that's all on like the new groups front. 
There are a few more activities that we do in uh, the steering committee. One of those is, uh, uh, okay, sorry, uh, sorry for the snafu. One of the activities that we do is conducting the uh, code of conduct committee elections uh, in the Kubernetes project. Uh, this year, we did change the process a little bit. Instead of doing a private voting using saves, we started using Electo, which is our in-house voting uh, project that also conducts the Kubernetes training committee elections to run the code of conduct committee elections as well. We had like 11 amazing candidates uh, for the two open slots in the code of conduct committee. What, after the, after the elections, what we uh, decided was we should probably improve the process a little more. So right now the process is like, the candidates who want to run for the code of conduct committee, they submit their candidacy using a Google form, and then we go ahead and populate the election uh, mechanism. But we want, what we want to do for next year is actually have the candidates nominate themselves directly on the GitHub repo, and then the election uh, app will take their candidacy up automatically. The other thing that we want to change is we also want to uh, change the dates of the code of conduct committee elections to closely align with the steering committee elections. Uh, what is it? It's, it's the opposite. Oh. They're too close right now. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so right now, the, the big issue is the code of conduct committee elections and steering committee elections essentially butt up to each other. And that has honestly been rather difficult to manage um, just from like an administrative side, plus what winds up happening is if a person that's running for the Code of Conduct Committee is potentially interested in running the steering committee, uh, they have to basically decline that role and then run again, again for steering. Um, what we would like to do is actually move, change the duration and change the date uh, which the Code of Conduct elections occur to after the steering committee elections, um, which currently happen um, in like September, October, and move them to say like January, just so there isn't uh, such heavy overlap. And that also gives an opportunity for any former steering members um, to run for the Code of Conduct Committee elections. So the, the next big thing that we are actively working on is looking at uh, annual reports. Um, one of the previous governance changes made by the steering committee uh, was actually meant to like reduce the amount of public check-ins. Uh, we previously required our groups to check in like uh, once a quarter, um, and this was bumping it and uh, also doing it like live on camera with like a deck, and this bumped it down to uh, just checking in once a year with uh, filling out a document with some information uh, about the status of their group. Um, you know, this was, ideally this is seen as like less work overall because you'd only be doing it, you know, once a year instead of, you know, once a quarter. Um, you know, it, it would serve as a good way for steering to check in with the group still and sort of get a pulse of the group's overall health. Um, but like outside, uh, the, the other thing that we wanted to do with them outside of, you know, a check in on their health is it also gave us a better way to surface the achievements and risks of that group to a larger audience with it being an actual document instead of something that is essentially in a recorded community meeting call. Now, as someone not working on the project um, every day, how, how you learn about those sort of, you know, recent changes and things they're struggling to keep help or keep up with, um, again, has been, been very difficult. We, after these annual reports were completed, we surfaced these up to the CNCF and a larger um, roll-up report was then served um, on the CNCF like report site and was advertised by them. Um, now you might think that all makes sense and that it's like less work um, overall but the reality has actually been something quite different. Um, we have had a lot of issues with people working on the annual reports. Um, so first, 
th this is uh, this year's results. Uh, I know the numbers don't quite line up with what we said earlier in terms of like our total groups, um, but the annual report process uh, doesn't exactly align with like calendar years right now, uh, so things are a little bit a tad off. Um, the other thing you might notice right off the bat is only two thirds of the groups actually completed and had a merged report. Um, you know, that isn't great, and especially for something that's supposed to be easier. Now, especially, uh, let's see, so, sorry, I, I don't wanna like dig into to the specifics of this quite yet, uh, but we'll look at a few things. So the, uh, there are a few things I wanna highlight from this year's report and the previous year's report. Um, and you know, from what you're, you're seeing here, it's a lot of red and yellow, and that doesn't paint a great picture, uh, but there's a lot of progress from you know red to yellow, so that is a nice like iterative growth. Um, so in 2021, there was a lot of areas that were you know not doing well, and they needed more reviewers, more approvers, just more people in the pipeline. Um, so in 2022, we started to do like several mentor cohorts uh, to try and help bring you know people up into targeted areas. And uh, frankly, we did have mixed results. Uh, some worked out quite well, uh, others not so much, uh, but we did learn a lot and have continued to make improvements. Our most recent mentor cohort has been wildly successful. Um, let's see. So similar on the next thing in uh, 2021, still, you know, at this point we were, we're still mid, mid, uh, mid pandemic. There was a lot of burnout amongst our maintainer community. Um, a lot of maintainers had, you know, less time and less good headspace to work on things. Um, but things did seem to improve in 2022 from, you know, general conversations with them. Um, and, you know, uh, the, the reports from what the leads gave us. But I'll leave a little asterisk there since, you know, a bunch of uh, SIGs didn't actually complete the, the <laughs> complete the reports. So from the data that we have, things are, we're looking a little bit better. Um, this last thing I want to highlight is up until last year, the Kubernetes infrastructure costs um, have only uh, really been fronted by Google. And so that's about you know, nine years of supporting everything in the project. Um, and we're talking you know, multiple millions of dollars per year. Um, and in 2021, things were starting to get bad. Uh, we came close to actually uh, running out of funds. And at the rate that we were growing, uh, we would definitely run out uh, by the end of 2022. So uh, Steering worked with the CNCF to help establish the cloud credits program. Um, and get you know start to try and bring on more vendors to help support our infrastructure costs. Um, this did succeed, like long term, we did get more vendors interested, but at the the rate of growth that we were having, and we weren't able to get uh, vendors on board fast enough, we actually came close to a point of having to decide: okay, do we, we do we turn off CI or do we stop serving images and break all our users? Um, Thankfully, we did uh, get an, an extension and were able to get enough coverage to get us through 2022. And you might remember at you know, this time last year, AWS announced that they were going to start you know, participating in the program. So you know, things are now looking good. Um, now the costs are split between Google and Amazon for our CI and image hosting. Uh, Fastly has actually gotten uh, involved in giving us uh, 50 petabytes of traffic a month for of their their CDN services for serving our binaries. Uh, Suzy has also um, donated their resources for their open build service, um, also letting us use them. And in uh, 2024, uh, it's looking likely that more vendors will be coming on board. So th th things are looking good now. There there is some green, I swear. <laughs> Um, let's see. The, the one thing that, that did honestly kind of suck out of this entire situation is it really did take a crisis for us to get all this additional engagement. Um, 
we are trying to find ways to surface this information uh, better and earlier to avoid us coming to a point where, again, we're you know, having to potentially make the call of, say, shutting down CI or stopping to serve images and just breaking a bunch of people. So, but yeah, things are looking good. So, with all the insights that Bob has talked about, you have seen a common pattern that we derive a lot of insights from how our community is working and shaping up through the annual reports. And this survey, really great way to know what the SIGs are up to. But the problem is the annual report process has not been very great. And several SIG leads have bubbled this up to us that some of the points in the annual report that they have to mention are kind of repetitive, can kind of be automated, and hence it results in a lot of toil for them, but the returns are less on that end. So we know that the reports are very useful, and both the leads and contributors have used them to justify what they work on in the community to their employers just because of these reports. So we want them to continue. But the thing is, we want the reports to be having as less overhead on our community leaders as much as possible. So the question is, what are, what, are the re, what are the meaningful parts that we should keep in the reports, and what are the things that don't serve much value? And those are the parts that we should take out of the reports. And the parts that are generated or can be generated from metrics that are already there in the community, they should probably be generated and not be gathered by the community leads and put into the reports. So what we want is, we want to know what works for you. We want to know from the audience and from our community leaders on what has been working for them in the annual reports and what hasn't been working for them. So that we as steering committee can change or improve the process for the next cycles. And you saw that we got only two thirds or 70% involvement from the SIGs in terms of filling the annual reports. We really want all the SIGs to fill in the annual reports because that serves a real great value. And one value I personally think is very important is that getting the annual reports and showing them to your managers or your company's leadership lets them invest in you so that you can come to the community and work in the community and grow the community. Uh, if you have thoughts, please uh, reach out to Steering. And with that, we are kind of at the end of the agenda. We'll come to Q&A. We, we actually then, are pretty close on time. I'm kind of surprised. Oh, wow. Uh, but before we move on to Q&A, we just wanted to let you know, like, how do you reach us? Um, we are on the public Slack channel called Steering Committee on the Kubernetes Slack. You can join the Kubernetes Slack by going to slack.kts.io and get an invite for yourself. Doesn't take much. Or you can join our uh, mailing list, steering at the red kubernetes.io. If you go to groups.google.com slash g slash uh, slash kubernetes slash steering, I think you can go to our, uh, you can join the mailing list. But then if you just go to the GitHub repo kubernetes slash community, you will find all the details on how to join the mailing list, how to join our meetings. Uh, and if you want something from us, you can always file an issue in Kubernetes slash steering. Big, big, big thing is we do really, really want to know what is useful to you in these reports. Not just our community members, but like as an end user or, you know, potentially uh, someone that is a, you know, employer of people that might be contributing, what sort of information would be useful to you to help continue to justify a commitment to the project? So if you have any ideas, please, 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 please reach out. We have one minute left, so I think we can take well, we, one question. Yeah, we, we can probably go over too. Does anyone actually have any questions? <laughs> that was also kind of a whirlwind, and I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. We can also really take stuff after this too, if you want to talk privately. We have more steering committee members. Oh, we got Sorry. one. We got one. We have two. Hey, um, not oh, really a question, just more of an answer to your previous question. Um, so I'm a tech lead for SIG Cluster Lifecycle. Um, we recently did a sub-project survey, so we kind of inspired ourselves from the SIG survey, but because Cluster Lifecycle is just made up of so many sub-projects, usually when we answer the SIG survey, it's like, it depends on the project. 
Um, so we try to do something similar so that we as SIG chairs and tech leads could have a better idea into what's actually going on in the projects. And one thing that I found really useful that I think it would be good to emphasize when we do these surveys is to encourage the SIGs to uh, not have the chairs and tech leads answer it in their corner, but instead have like a meeting where they do yes. kind of like a retrospective and then they talk about it. I, um, I, I have literally brought that up in every chair and TL meeting I've been in and talked about it in reports. <laughs> yeah, because I, I sat in those meetings where subprojects did that and everyone was like, whoa, we should do this more often. <laughs> so I think, yeah, that would be a really great way to make it a conversation starter instead of a chore that people feel like they have to do on top of the million things that they have to do. Yeah. The, the other thing that like I've encouraged, like if you have someone in your SIG that is you're potentially thinking about promoting to a lead, is to try and you know get them to lead that conversation. Because it, it's a great way for them to, you know, just get to know all the various sub projects more and just get to know the people better. Yeah, I, I know a couple of uh, SIGs where the Chairs and TLs have not written the report, and someone else in the SIG who is contributing has written yeah. the report. And that's a great way to involve contributors. And this also removes confirmation bias. <laughs> okay. OK, with that, I think we can Call take, it. Take, yeah, take it async. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.